Do we get an amen? Okay, I'll just start then. I mean, I'm starting with some thanks, obviously, to uh, Antonella of Canyon and Dina of the lab for being our infrastructure tonight and presenting this program. I couldn't have thought of more perfect partners in this kind of thing. And I couldn't think of a more perfect space to see Kern's films than here. Uh, I've been looking at and thinking about Kren's films in various ways for almost 10 years now. It's a little depressing. I've traveled to 22 sites in seven countries, visiting archives and doing interviews. I've seen all the films more times than I can count, though I must say I have never watched them in projection with an audience, so I'm very excited for that. Um, I've read the journal where he kept notes. There we go and worked out his editing scores. I've gone over rental records at various cooperatives in Europe and the United States to see just who has been watching his films. I've had long conversations with experimental music composers about his scores, with filmmakers about his editing techniques, with curators and distribution center directors about the exhibitionary context for work like Krenz since the 70s. In 2016, I helped initiate conversations that would lead to the acquisition of his estate um, and this current exhibition of his non-film archive, which is up, in case you're in Vienna, is up right now at the Museum of Modern Art. If you're gonna be there in the next two weeks. Um, and at one point, also back in 2016, I even got to sit alone in the off-site storage of the Austrian National Museum and wear Krin, Krin's leather jacket, which you see here on the left. I did not take a selfie because it felt inappropriate. Um, but I sat there wearing the jacket and reading letters from his then wife, Marnie, which you see on the right. It's, it's weird, I know. It's a little fangirl, possibly trollish. All of those things are true. Um, but I share all of this just to give a sense of the range of ways I've gotten to know and literally wrapped myself up uh, in Crin's life and his practice over the years. So this is an amazing uh, privilege to be able to do this tonight. And here we see Kryn at his last retrospective, which was um, at SFAI 20 years ago in 1998, just a few months before his death. But for as much as I have thought about and looked at Kurt Kryn's films, I have to give a special thanks to my co-curator, Tooth, whose deeply poetic ways of seeing, in general, have helped me to meet Kryn's practice anew, and I hope my talk tonight can offer that same gesture of seeing Krenz practice anew to those of you here who maybe know his work already. And I'm gonna try to offer some buoys for those of you not so familiar with what's a very, very dense practice. So just to give a little bit of the lay of the land, I'm gonna talk for about 35 minutes. Sorry, it was three seconds and then 35 minutes of me. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a lot of different films in depth. I'm also gonna reference some films and not talk so much about them. And the reason I'm doing this is to give a, a sense of how to engage the ideas I'm talking about across. So it's not just one or three films or something like this. Uh, and the ideas are in two interrelated spheres. The first is what I'm calling the life of film. Uh, which proposes ways of thinking about Krenz's practice as a mirror um, onto the worlds, and I mean that spatially, discursively, and representationally, of non, anti, and counter institutional cinema. Uh, his films immerse us in the infrastructures of a cinematic op apparatus. It's screening spaces, movie houses, makeshift movie houses like this. It's projectors, it's screens, it's distribution strategies, it's press practices, and so on. Um, and in doing that, the films plunge us into the many complicated and often convoluted ways in which these components of the apparatus were performed otherwise in the underground scenes through which Kryn himself moved between 56 and 96. We are in the thick of it, the infrastructures that is, and we are surrounded. The second sphere of ideas I'm gonna talk about tonight, films of life, picks up on these ideas of being surrounded and in the thick of it, offering a, a kind of reading of Krenz's famed editing techniques, which I'm sure we're gonna hear more about this weekend. But I'm gonna offer a reading that's actually about deferment and refusal. Uh, in the thick of it, as Krenz described in a Q&A at the Pacific Film Archive in 1980, is, quote, where swimming begins, end quote. So, part one, the life of film. 
The screen flashes up with the light of a projector and the space glows red. In a brief flicker of light, a group of faces appear. In the few seconds they remain, we can vaguely make out that these faces are watching a screen. They too are audience members. They stare back at us in our positions behind their screen, beyond their screen. The image goes dark and the room goes dark again. As the scene continues to flicker in and out, lighting the theater on both this side and that side of the screen for the next four minutes, we see people lounging on rows of blanketed benches which populate the small theater over there. Sometimes they engage in focused conversations. Sometimes they casually lean back to roll cigarettes. Sometimes they edit film. Once or twice, someone arises from a bed in the back of the auditorium and dresses after getting some rest. This theater space is for more than just screening. It is a meeting point, an editing room, a space for relaxing and conversing, even on occasion, a shelter for the night. At another point in the film, a man engaged in conversation cuts onto the screen in the foreground. He looks directly out for him at the projection screen, for us at the camera. Another co-op member a few seconds later raises his forearm in a gesture towards it, towards us, maybe. After lighting a cigarette, he leans back, stretching his arms upward and outward in what appears to be some sort of measure of scale, a measure of a kind of expanse. Is he gesturing towards the camera, towards film, towards the person behind that camera, maybe? towards the screen that is projecting his recorded image or possibly to us on this side of the screen. Just what exactly does that outstretched gesture include in its grasp? So this is from Crin's 3073 co-op cinema Amsterdam. In it, he turns the camera towards the infrastructural space of the co-op, locating us viewers of the film somewhere between diegetic and non-diegetic, on-screen and off-screen, front stage and backstage structures, the film's production and its exhibition. In so doing, he poses a query asked in nearly every film, where are the spaces that cinema can happen? If it is a particular form of communication, what are the conditions that which, or the, uh, what are the conditions that which audience can see it? And what do these, what I call performances of cinema, look like? We can begin to think of the outstretched arms of the co-op member gesturing um, as also directing our attention, his own perhaps, to the edges of our collective frames, of the screen, of the movie house, of cooperative space, of pedagogical space, of cinema. The blurring of divisions between spaces, between mediums, between markets, between roles in the film industry's division of labor, these were the effects of an expanding of distribution for moving image materials that were not quite art and not quite film either in their institutional and market senses, I mean. It was a new horizon of access to moving image, a communication outside of what's been called cinema's institutional order. Historically, this new horizon has come down to us as expanded cinema, a strategy of mixed media production that emerged in the mid-1960s and remained influential, and this could be debated for sure, but remained influential at least through the late 1970s. Uh, to give just a few examples, Stan Vanderbeek's movie drone is a key case study for the preeminence of sight uh, for the project. Uh, Vanderbeek constructed a dome in upstate New York, if you're not familiar, and it housed a multi-screen continuous communication stream which totally immersed uh, viewers in a media world. One can also think of the works of members of Krenn's own cohort in Vienna. In ZZZ Hamburger Special, Hans Schweigel, for instance, ran a string of yarn through the projector. Peter Weibel and Valley Export created projects like the 1967 Nivea and 68 Tap and Touch Cinema, which unfurled the screen into real space and cast the artist's own bodies as the sites for projection. We see genealogies of expanded cinema in museums all the time today, as moving image installations and performance projection projects appear inside white cubes and modified black boxes, sometimes intended for those spaces and sometimes versioned for it versus the versions for festivals. Meanwhile, at those film festivals, performances are increasingly part of the program, the liveness of the screening event emphasized by, for instance, joining an experimental live set from Thurston Moore with a screening of Maya Darren's films. This liveness of the screening as an event form is certainly important, I of course think so, but I think in focusing on that form, discourses on expanded cinema often overlook the life of film. Krenn's practice instead helps us to track this life of film, from his controversy igniting collaborations with the actionist performance artist 
to highly reflexive works like Co-op Cinema Amsterdam, to psychedelic records like this, 2369 Underground Explosion, which is actually a mescaline-induced document of a experimental music concert, uh, to 2973 Ready Made, a found footage reflection on studio production processes and litigations, to 4283 No Film, the iconoclastic installation like gesture that we just saw. Uh, Kren consistently tracks the lives of film in all of these different works um, and pushes at the limits of institutional industrial models. And when I say pushed at the limits, I mean it in multiple senses. Usually when uh, connected to Kren's practice, this push at the limits is in reference to his collaborations with the Viennese actionists, which we'll hear more about tomorrow. The action films are still Kren's most well-known works. Uh, Oh, that's not right. Stills like these were circulated uh, for the screening press. You can't see them, but stills were circulated for the screening press up through the 1990s, and that was actually by Kren's own hand because he was aware that that's what people wanted to see. Uh, the action films have made it into survey textbooks on 20th century art and framed by narratives of post-war catharsis. They are go-to examples uh, for studies on performance and documentation. Uh, especially since the 1998 Out of Actions exhibition that brought renewed attention. Um, in this performance and documentation context, they push at the limits of liveness and discourse. Another standard context Krenz films are understood to push limits in is within uh, body art traditions. He became particularly important during the rise of 1980s body art practices. His films often screening alongside the film and performance work of figures like Diamante Golas and Nan Golden. Additionally, the action film's influence on canonical Los Angeles-based artist uh, Paul McCarthy was significant in, in the development of McCarthy's practice. And actually, if you want to find it, I think it's available online. Uh, McCarthy's 1979 interview with Kren is one of the best interviews that exists out there because Kren was a man of very few words. Um, in relation to these kinds of body art practices of Galas or McCarthy, or uh, Kren's work stand as early examples of pushing at limits of a normative body politic, and it's historically accurate. They did do that. In the 1960s and 70s, long before he came here to San Francisco, Kren's films were confiscated in Vienna and in various cities around West Germany. At one point, their seizure in a massive raid in Bavaria prohibited the reel's availability for a retrospective program scheduled in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, and the retrospective was subsequently canceled. Uh, the, the, this pushing at limits of the state body politic had a direct impact on Kren's career and the ability of his work to circulate. So, shitting on screen, sorry, spoiler alert, that uh, was definitely one level of pushing at limits, and there is quite a lot to talk about when it comes to on-screen decency debates around the action films. A work like this, 1667, uh, September 20th, remains much contested, if no longer legally than culturally to this day. But for me, what makes this gesture potent, uh, beyond the scatological shock, is when I think of it next to a film like 2973, ready-made, uh, subtitled Three Letters by Marx or the Terror of Media. In 2973, Kren appropriated footage from a Westdeutsch Rundfunk television documentary on the classic 1942 Hollywood film Casablanca, uh, for which he had been hired as a talking head. These, of course, are some of the amazing images we have in store and I can't, spoiler alert. In the footage, Kren reads letters written by Groucho Marx to Jack Warner so here's the first page uh, from the original English version. The subject of Groucho's text is the cease and desist order Warner Brothers had had issued against the Marx Brothers 1946 A Night in Casablanca, which is a spoof on the classic uh, film, Hollywood film. Uh, I'll just read one line from the le the this first letter to give a sense of the tone. Quote, I just can't understand your attitude, even if they plan on re-releasing the picture. I am sure that the average movie fan could learn to distinguish between Ingrid Bergman and Harpo. <laughs> I don't know whether I could, but I certainly would like to try, end quote. So the WDR documentary project was abruptly abandoned once production was completed and the film was never aired. One can't help but wonder if the reasons were political. 
Hidden beneath Groucho's playful jab at the Hollywood star system in the scope of Warner Brothers' copyright claims was a critique of Jack Warner, of the production studio, and of US patriotism. In the midst of the Hulak Hollywood trials when the studio system proved its complicity with McCarthy-era censures and purges, this was a particularly charged moment in institutional cinema and 2973 turns a document from that history of anti-censorship legal battles into a script. A script that is performed by a, a f experimental filmmaker who was himself frequently a target of censorship. Crin becomes a kind of actor, non-actor, enlivening a debate about the political mores of mainstream film distribution and policy that impacted his practice just as it had impacted the practice of the Marx Brothers. The actor, non-actor then becomes filmmaker again, saving the footage from the editing room floor and making of it a ready-made on the terror of the media. Not unlike Duchamp's ready-mades that famously exposed the contingency of the meaning of art on its institutional contexts, Crin exposes the contingency of the category of film on its context, particularly in this case, its context of studio production and the entrenched policies of such a system within both state and commercial markets. Well, that's strange. That's not supposed to be like that. Uh, so for me, uh, the pushing at limits in works like 2973 Ready Made or 3073 Co-op Cinema Amsterdam key us into the blind spots of historical accounts of expanded cinema and its supposed partner slash forerunner, its unclear experimental film. In actuality, these two categories are incredibly porous and current rather narrow accounts of the expanded arrest the incredible energy unleashed within experimental film by the filmmakers' cooperatives and the new forms of thinking about the institution of media and communication, like those captured in Crin's Ready Made, and new forms of making events, like those we saw in the co-op theater in Amsterdam. The expanding of cinema I'm interested in, Crin's films engaged again and again, changed not only in aesthetic form, but transformed the ways that distribution and exhibition were understood in the arts. So to be clear, when I'm talking about expanding, I'm talking about performances, aesthetic and social. As Annette Michelson, may she rest in peace, articulated in 1966, speaking of film as radical potential, at stake is the matter of when a medium becomes industry and under what terms it does so. What even seemed possible changed dramatically when the filmmaker or with the filmmakers co-ops when non-institutional films were available for rental, when distribution catalogs culled together in one place the huge range of moving images that were not narrative or narrative in non-feature length ways. I mean, it's weird for us, I get it, but just the idea of a distribution catalog was a huge deal. Uh, also, when film screenings started appearing or reappearing really as self-aware and self-made events, which staked out different kinds of spaces where bodies could gather. Uh, when films like Crin's could circulate beyond their immediate locales, and there should be a picture here, like the church gallery uh, in Vienna where, uh, they first, uh, where his films first screened in 1961, beyond that to bars and universities, community colleges and community centers, discotheques, bars, small art theaters and cooperative spaces, museums and film festivals of all sizes, outdoor screenings and occupied warehouses across cities, countries and continents. Like the outstretched, oh good, we're back. Like the outstretched embrace of the Amsterdam co-op member, Kren's scope of reflection on these changes was expansive. He filmed photographs and slides and people at media events, people looking and people taking photographs and posing for photographs and film critics. And he used outtakes from commercial productions and recorded film crews on break. And the list I could keep going, but you hopefully get it. His unique tendency to film media cultures and the practices of looking and being seen uh, from which non-anti and counter-institutional cinema practices sprang is part of what makes his work so compelling still. Taken cumulatively, the works uh, held a mirror up to the kinds of things that became possible in market formation and social relation when limits were pushed in infrastructural ways, when producers imagined themselves as distribu distributors and vice versa, rebuilding communication infrastructures and the perceptual encounters they staged from the ground up infrastructures which were, and I would add still are, 
adjacent to rather than synonymous with institution and industries of art and film. These performances of cinema, or what I'm thinking of tonight as lives of film, are what Corinne keys us into. It was also from within those lives of film that Corinne reflected upon the nature of communication and perception, those relational processes that constitute life. Part two, films of life. The other point I'll make tonight has to do with this. Uh, so from Electric Cinema, the space that was occupied by the Amsterdam Cooperative, which brought Crin, um, and that's where 3073 came from, let's return to the house of film and Crin's restless place, if not inside, at least on the property now. Perhaps it was always a difficult fit, for as uh, filmmaker Taka Amura wrote in 1969 of Crin's work, quote, it would be better called reflected picture, which is a direct translation in Japanese than to call it motion picture in English. Amira, I think, is onto something here about Krenz and his film's capacities for reflection. They seem not to perform the cues of film's motion picture status, even as they may take up narratively loaded content and sometimes be in such fast motion that we can't actually understand what we're seeing. The ways he chose to reflect spaces and people and histories inundates us. We're in the thick of it. Leave, and he leaves us awash with complicated filmic rhythms and often intense visual content that floods the perceptual system, visually and conceptually. The idea of rude and playful shadows haunting a house, dashing through its rooms and ruffling the curtains and bed sheets, its built-in projection screens, seems to capture something of the kind of frenetic reflection Crin used. He was, of course, not alone in his inquiries into perception, that's a hallmark of experimental film. But in Krenn's work, this inquiry involved a deeply ethical set of questions, questions which still haunt the house of film. In the midst of the jarring visual experiences of his work, we are presented with the overwhelming task of reflection on communication, on the fraught processes of bringing structure to our experience, and on the ethics of bearing witness. For Crin, films of life were inquiries into the nature of identification and, in a Levinasian sense, recognition of an other. Now, this is a different orientation to existential thought. Rather than action as the basis for existence, it centers recognition and the processes of interpolation into subjecthood. And I think in the faces of even some of his closest collaborators, Crin's practice rudely and playfully resisted a centering of the self-action so familiar from other experimental film, like, say, from his friend Stan Brockage, as well as from almost every performance practice we can think of from the 60s and 70s. Instead, Crin's films were experiments into ways of seeing, of recognizing, and reflecting upon the social relations involved in seeing, in recognition, and the cultures which uh, gave rise to these kind of relations, both inside and outside the regimes of visual culture, from co-ops to art performances to Hollywood studios to newsreel imagery, so we can see Krenn's interest in ways of seeing in his very early 260, uh, 48 Kopfe aus dem Zondi test. Uh, the four and a half minute film systematically records the facial features of 48 heads, characteristic of antisocial and delinquent behavior, or characteristic of that according to a 1935 personality test that was developed by this guy, uh, Leopold Zondi. 260 is an icon of experimental film. It was the first of Crin's works to use the mathematically precise editing techniques for which he is known. And its repetitive close-up structure, I would add, engages us in the dubious histories of xenophobic ideology built upon representation and in particular, the frenzy of the visual that accompanied the emergence of moving images in the first place. What do we see when we look closely into the eyes of the 48 Zondi heads? Or, to switch gears a little, alternatively, what do we see when we look into Reagan's face as it twitches and glitches on Crin's television screen so seemingly far from us in 4384-1984? The stakes of recognition were especially reflected in war films like 2068 Shotzi and 2470 Western. Both works methodically record the surface, surfaces of the images of atrocity. In 2068, 
print films a photograph found in a friend's attic. The image shows a military officer of unknown nationality, though, though presumably a member of, the, of Nazi Germany's Schutzstaffel or SS paramilitary group. The officer stands with hands folded behind his back as he surveys the field of bodies. He faces away from the camera. His identity and affect is obscured as those bodies that are laying around him. Using a permutation-based editing structure, the three-minute film twitches between positive and negative prints of the photograph, haunting the spectator with its brutal frankness. Similarly, 2470 Western haunts us, but now with well, what was then a more recent image from the ongoing Vietnam War and its representation in protest culture of the time. In the film, 2470, Crin records an anti-Vietnam War poster produced in New York by the Art Workers Coalition, uh, which reproduced a photograph taken by the Army photographer Ron Ronald Haberl of women and children massacred in the US-led My Lai invasion. In the poster, the photograph is framed by the text Q and babies, A and babies. The words lifted from a television interview and close the image, bleeding into it and staining the scene red. Crin takes us into the violent scene, but as Malcolm Legrice described in 1975, quote, the, close, the closest Crin comes to, a simple, to simple political content and direct reference uh, to the underlying image, uh, the recognition of the image is withheld. In Western, it's done by an exploration of the poster in such extreme close-up that it is again the surface rather than the message which forms the dominant experience. The ambivalence first choosing the material for its connotations, then denying simple interpretation by withholding early or at any stage certain recognition is evident through the irony of a formalist presentation of emotionally loaded images. At the same time, the irony is not a satire. It's a device for confronting the viewer with a complex response, even where simple condemnation would otherwise suggest itself as self-evident reaction." End quote. So as in the acclaimed uh, action films of the mid-60s, or 48 Kopfa, or later in his silent recording of Reagan, Crin's close-ups in 2470 Western radically decontextualize the image and focus on, their, on the surfaces of the bodies, their gestures, their expressions, short-circuiting intended responses. Spectators, witnesses to the poster, are meant to abhor the gruesome scene and be moved by moral outrage at the thought of even babies. But what are we supposed to feel when we see 2470 Western? It, like 2068 Shotzi, experiments with the limits of that union between experience and structure, reflecting on the ethics of seeing what is seen and how it is seen through the camera and also through the lens of media communication cultures including those of activist cultures. The suspension of identification, what Legrice called ambivalence in Crin's two war films and in his other films, I would suggest, is not so much directed at the content, but at those systems of representation through which these histories, images, bodies, and faces move, and in which they take on functionary ideological valences or messages. The suspension of identification was a kind of refusal a refusal of the identification both of and with the images. And these refusals were pervasive, whether the identification be with the bodies of the performers of an, in his action films, or the faces of those in Zondi Test or Reagan, or the bodies of both perpetrators and victims of war and state violence in Germany and Vietnam, or even the bodies of those co-op members in Amsterdam. Sometimes it's more difficult for us to get behind his refusals, like perhaps in 2470 Western. We resist often his resistance. We want to identify, we want to recognize, we want to find meaning, we want to confirm our subject status. Crin does too, but none of us ever can. The close-ups and rapid cut editing structure appear precise and yet their rhythm and yet the rhythms they introduce produce no meaning. In 1567 Tefau, for instance, the precise mathematical structure was based on the rhythm of a child's nursery rhyme. These structural kinds of refusals became increasingly emphatic uh, once he was in the United States. During the 1980s in Texas, when Crin worked as a museum guard, 
Um, when Quinn worked as a museum guard, um, he produced a series of rubber stamps and Polaroids conceived around the notion meaning lessons, a term he created to mark a kind of theoretical position. Meaning lessons combine meaning and essence in a Venn diagram-like formation in which they share a, a less or a without. From terms of phrase like this, okay, to Surgeon General's warning, to Fernichtet or destroyed, the stamps are irreverently tongue-in-cheek. They combine Krenn's refusal with an ethos of quick distribution from the zine cultures in which he was increasingly absorbed. Each thing Krenn stamps touched, even a mailing envelope, turned into a kind of refusal. You can see the downward spiraling airplanes here, for instance, negating the Par Avignon post. His refusals are, take up a kind of a, a punk position, and yet also, as the title of this retrospective signals, and it's also the title of a 1979 film by Krenn, it's also sentimental, but the sentimentality here is not saccharine. In fact, in 2068 Schatzi, Krenn calls out that kind of mawkish nostalgia, pairing the German term of endearment, uh, sweetie or darling, with a photograph of killing fields. The sentimentality in Krenn's films is related back to that existential search for recognition and identification that is always frame after frame, suspended and deferred. Films of life in this sense are not so much scenes of life, though the personal, cultural, and geopolitical scenes that constituted Krenn's life certainly make appearances. But by life here, I'm referring more to those processes and systems that organize our perception in the face of an other. I'm talking about life as a kind of recognition. Films of life in this sense were films that reflected these processes and systems of recognition, sometimes non-recognition, sometimes misrecognition, and so on. They reflect them right back at us, sometimes in their most violent and sometimes most psychedelic manifestations. So I'm gonna close with this last thought. Uh, Krenn's practice of seeing seeing was deeply informed by a life lived in displacement. I've never been interested in psychobiography, which makes it weird to do a monograph project, um, but I didn't open with this. Um, but I do think that to understand, understand Krenn's practice, it is helpful to understand something of his orientation to life and to recognition and identity. So just to give a quick overview of this, for those that don't already know. In 1939, at 10 years old, Kurt Krenn was sent on a child transport for Jewish youths to Rotterdam. It was about 15 months after the Anschluss, or the German annexation of Austria. Just two years later, he watched the Nazi bombing of Rotterdam from the rooftop of his semi-permanent home there, a memory he recounted in several different interviews over the years. So seven years after the bombing, uh, in 1947 at 18, Krenn repatriated into Austria, where though treated as an outcast with his family, I'm looking again, the strange, small, uncomfortable reminder of the wartime, he was reintegrated into the state through a position that was offered to him at the National Bank. And it was on the break room table at that bank that Krenn edited some, some of his most well-known films, including the action films. Uh, but in 1970, he left Austria once again, this time fleeing criminal charges against him for distribution of pornography. His action films uh, were considered pornographic by moral decency laws at the time. Over the next 20 years, he would return again and again to this state of displacement that was familiar from his youth. And moving from city to city across countries, he was never quite at home and only sometimes had a house. In West Germany in the 70s, he relied on support structures for a place to sleep, and later in Texas during the early 80s, he lived in his car. It's the car we see here, which is documented in 3981, which way to CA, that's California. Uh, in early 1983, friends in Texas even held a benefit concert to help him get deposit money together for an apartment. As one friend from Houston recounted to me, uh, Krenn would always plan his travel on the holidays to avoid this question of home. So with no sense of home, he was intensely focused on the unfamiliarity of the surroundings he was constantly in. 
as with the infrastructures for cinema practices, things were continually and sometimes very quickly changing for him, and identification was often a self-conscious and not so successful process. Uh, wherever he found himself, though, Crin immersed himself in the local underground scenes of that place, um, as well as in international exchanges that were happening in those scenes. So pieces of meaning lessons, uh, for instance, appeared in journals and zines and mail art projects in California, Croatia, and Japan. But to say that Crin's refusal can be explained just by these conditions of his life lived in displacement, I think would be untruthful because it was also informed by whatever inside of him helped, uh, held the capacity for critical reflection and punk sentimentality. His longing for identification led him into more undergrounds than most of us can actually imagine. And to that end, it was the boundlessness of Crin's curiosity, his attentiveness and his willingness and openness to engaging with different ways of living and different lives of film in that kind of Levinasian sense of recognition, which set the terms of his refusal. Or this is what I imagine anyway, but maybe I too am only a sentimental punk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>